Hello and welcome to the Brave New Weed podcast. And now here's your host, Joe Dolce. Welcome to another episode of the Brave New Weed podcast. Conversations for the post-prohibition era, which is approaching more quickly than any of us could have imagined at this point in time. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Joe. Happy to be back again. Always good to see you. Yeah, man. Uh, and, and a great episode uh, queued up this Tonight week. with it's- Deborah Kimless. This is a really interesting episode about the way the food we eat can affect the healing power of cannabis. And I know as a full-fledged eater, you're going to really enjoy this. Oh, yeah. This. I'm, I'm, I'm in high gear to, to jump right ahead. And no, it's really interesting it. to talk about nutrition and cannabis and nutrition and healing in general. But, but Dr. Kimless has been studying this for a number of years, and she's very, very good on topic. And we're going to talk about a lot about the V word tonight. <laughs> and her, she is adamant to not use the V word. We're not talking about that quite yet. We're going to skip that part. Why don't we do some news first? Yes, sir. So, Joe, one of the things that we have regularly talked about uh, on the podcast is the efforts to normalize. And in the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, many examples of this normalization of cannabis in society have, have come to light. What are you seeing? Uh, well, uh, the, the whole thing kicked off with um, Vox Media, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Love Vox. Uh, they have their own series. It's a micro documentary series on Netflix. It's called Explained. And the newest episode is uh, Explained Cannabis. And it is a 20 minute journey through the history of cannabis, all the way from its genetic origins in uh, Central Asia, all the way up to the current state of cannabis in the world. And, and they didn't call us to <laughs> consult on this topic? I'm surprised they didn't. It, it, the, the episode uh, features Kyle Cushman, uh, Dr. Carl Hart. These are all people that, that are in circles that you clearly run in. I'm surprised they didn't ring your phone, I'm Joe. I'm very sad that they didn't. But As, come on, Vox, get on it. We'll talk to, we'll talk to you about some interesting things. Uh, but the, the absolutely strongly recommend that listeners to the podcast uh, go and check out the episode. It it's is, 20 minutes. It's 20 minutes long. It's, it's direct. It's to the point. It's a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. Great. Uh, they dispel the indica versus sativa myth. They explain what those two words even mean. It's time. They talk about how prohibition has ratcheted up the intensity of THC content. They talk about how THC and CBD and CBN on all these uh, uh, cannabinoids work together, um, how it in- impacts your system. Okay, like, okay, good. Are you getting, are you getting paid by Vox tonight? I, I'm not, okay. nor Netflix. <laughs> but man, it, it was just really good. And uh, I think everybody should go and, and give 20 minutes to check that out. Thank you for your review, Matthew. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but it is one of several normalization things. Uh, explained weed to try and get people up to it. Another uh, streaming service platform, uh, which is new to the scene, something called Rivet TV, has recently launched. It's Rivet, R I V E T? I T. R I V I T. Rivet. R I V I T TV.com. Uh, and what it is is basically like a, a crowdfunding platform. You can make a pilot television show. You can go on there, and if people like it, they can say, yes, I want to see more, and they can donate money to your cause. So very you know, familiar ground in that. However, this company has chosen to launch itself by being the debut platform for Kevin Smith's new television series, Hollyweed, which stars him and Donnell Rollins. Uh, Donnell plays the owner of a cannabis dispensary, and Kevin Smith plays a bud tender. I am a huge fan of Kevin Smith. You know, when I used to edit magazines, details, we were the first one to cover him, to acknowledge what a great filmmaker he is. So, Kevin, (laughs) come back on the Brave New Weed podcast. Well, he's been a pot guy for a long time, but I found it... uh, I found it very interesting that this company would choose to identify so quickly and so early on yeah, with yeah. cannabis and just yeah. be like, yeah, it's cannabis. We're, we're in. They're obviously going after young men who smoke some weed. Just more of that normalization process. And there was one other example that popped up in the past week, which I found hilarious. And I forwarded you the article, the headline of which says that alien DNA was found in cannabis. Yeah. They ma- they mapped the genome. This was the headline. They mapped the genome and that alien DNA was found in cannabis. What did you think of the article? That was clickbait. <laughs> it was indeed. That was clickbait. It was very it was probably very effective. I'm sure I know that went around the internet 
that day. Yeah, it was the, hugely. It came across my feeds in, in several different instances. So to let you guys in on the secret, it was a, a website um, called I Fucking Love Science, which is a fantastic resource for science news. And the whole point of the article was that people are reacting and responding to just headlines without clicking and reading the article. But I, I just found it very fascinating that they chose to use cannabis and aliens and aliens as a way to cut <laughs> through the noise to get people to to engage. So, uh, again, I think it's just one more example of cannabis normalization in our society. Other big news in the world of cannabis, uh, the, un the United Kingdom has now approved prescriptions for medical cannabis for certain cases uh, for use in what the United Kingdom. What was formerly the United Kingdom. Let's remember <laughs> Brexit. Brexit happened. There's not going to be much of the United Kingdom very longer. But that's good news, and it's big news. And this is a country that has not... Interestingly, it's a country that has allowed a lot of pharmaceutical research to go on regarding mm. cannabis. People, That's where GW Pharmaceuticals is, is based, for example. Gotcha. But it is not a country that has ever really been talking about legalization. All my friends there were completely surprised when they made this move. But this is going to be a big move. Yeah, it's, it all is in response to a case uh, of a 12-year-old boy who suffered from a rare form of epilepsy. And it was uh, he was granted an emergency license. Uh, to use uh, cannabis Epilepsy oil. Epilepsy has really changed the the laws in favor of cannabis. For some reason, epilepsy is the is the indication that changes every single law. Well, because it's cannabis really turns out to be super effective in treating uh, epileptic seizures, especially in children. And these are the the high profile things that people want to see. Yeah. This is the gold standard of good cannabis news. I think. Well, my favorite news story of the week happened in Indiana, actually. I'm not sure it's a sign of normalization or abnormalization at this point. But there was this church that was started in 2015. It was called the First Church of Cannabis. It was founded by a nice, nice Jewish boy called Bill Levin, actually, who gr crowned himself the grand puba of the church. <laughs> and um, Indiana, of course... Did not was not happy about this, but I thought this was a really cool church. Um, they had some great commandments. They have actually twelve commandments, some of which include "Don't be an asshole," um, which is honestly you're done right there, right? Well, like, I, I mean, I think it's a really uh, that a, a lot of people should join this church. If everybody could just follow, help that others when you can. Treat your body as a temple. Don't poison it with poor quality food and soda. Don't take advantage of people. Never start a fight. Only finish them. Grow food, raise animals, get nature into your routine. Don't troll the internet. Protect those who can't protect themselves. Laugh often. And they use cannabis as a sacrament. Now, what was really interesting is... Well, they is want to, they right? They want to. Well, of course, the, this town that it's in... Which, what is the town? Is it Indianapolis? Uh, yeah, Indianapolis, Indianapolis, Indiana. was not very happy with the sacrament of cannabis. So what they did is they installed security cameras... They put armed guards in front of the church. Um, they basically made it quite difficult. And I think this week, what happened? Yeah, so in, in 2015, when the church was founded, Indiana had just passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And this allowed them to go and actually found as a church. And then they immediately filed a lawsuit to get themselves exempt from the law so that they could use marijuana in their mm -hmm. in their religious sacrament. And uh, a county superior court judge, uh, Jude Cheryl Lynch, has ruled that, in fact, they cannot smoke marijuana as part of their religious sacrament. Well, I think we should all join this church. <laughs> yeah, we, we're going to go. That's what I think. We should all Jesus. write letters to Bill Levin, the grand pooba of the First Church of Cannabis in Indianapolis, and say, we want to join your church. Well, and it's, I, I don't think it's that difficult to join, right? Like, uh, I think you just, you, just, you know, don't be an asshole, right? And so, and use a certain sacrament every day. And there's there's a uh, a membership fee. Oh, that's right, four dollars and twenty cents. Of course. Listeners of the Brave New Weedcast, we're still looking for your help in claiming our custom URL on YouTube. We've recently launched the podcast. It's available at you, on youtube.com if you search for the Brave New Weedcast. But we need 100 of you out there to subscribe to the channel so that we can change the URL to be youtube.com slash brave new weed. So please go to YouTube, search for the Brave New Weed podcast and subscribe today. So in the past, the only connection between 
cannabis and food was really, as you know, eat a mango and it'll extend your high, right? But our guest tonight, Dr. Deborah Kimless, has been thinking about food and and the, and the plant in very new and novel ways, been researching it for many, many years. She's really an expert on lots of things in cannabis. She talks a lot about the endocannabinoid system and microdosing, using topicals, and how we can use food and how we can change the way cannabis is absorbed in the body by changing the food we eat. And this is a really fascinating topic that no one has broached that I'm aware of, and I'm so honored and pleased to have her join the show this evening. Dr. Deborah Kimless, thank you so much for joining us on the Brave New Weed podcast. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, you were an anesthesiologist for much of your career and then sort of segued into medical cannabis. Can you give us a quick recap on how that happened? Absolutely. I grew up in the just say no era and I actually believed it. Never tried cannabis uh, recreationally as a kid because I thought that uh, you know the stereotypes and the stigma attached to it was true. And it wasn't until my mom was dying from um, a pharmaceutical, a complication from a pharmaceutical prescribed by a physician taken as directed. Um, did I recognize that maybe I had it all wrong? It, during the time it was 2013 that people were having conversations about cannabis as medicine. And sadly, my mom passed before I was able to help her with it. But I actually have dedicated my entire life studying medical cannabis, helping guiding over 350 patients, um, using the microdose medical cannabis for treatment of their medical um, ailments and have seen incredible successes with their health, more so than what I have realized using traditional medicine. I'm a little confused though. How did you go from your mom's death into medical cannabis? That's not a natural path necessarily. Well, because we started to, to look at pharmaceuticals as perhaps not being everything that they've said was true. Um, and my mom had um, a paradoxical response to opiates where she had an enhanced pain instead of a, a diminished pain. Yeah. She was dying, dying from a, a horrible, painful complication from a medicine. And she sustained that um, using Tylenol and it didn't work. And um, my significant other who is from Israel kept saying medical cannabis could be something that she could use. And I said, it sounded like a punchline to a joke. And sadly <laughs> I started researching it. And it, in 2013, which was, you know, dog years in cannabis a very long time ago, um, there was not a whole lot of information out there. So when she died, I went around the world. I studied in Israel. I went to the Netherlands and uh, took a master class through the national program. And when I got back, I started researching and um, helping pride patients so that they didn't have to suffer the sequela like my mom did. How was the master class in Holland? It was incredible. Tell me. It was incredible. It was uh, through Bedrican. I don't... Sadly, I don't think they're doing it anymore or they're doing it in a different iteration. It's a pharmaceutical um, company, right, Bedrican? Bedrican is a medical cannabis company that um, supplies all of the cannabis through um, the entire country of the Netherlands. Right. And I think they had some relationship in Canada as well. Yeah. But um, their lead scientist, Dr. Haskamp, um, was the one that uh, – it was the brainchild of his. And he uh, arranged for – basic science researchers from around the world to gather and educate um, different types of stakeholders throughout the, the world. So it was myself and uh, two other people that represented the United States and the rest of the people were from all the varied countries. And there was 20 of us for, I think it was 12 days and it was an intense learning experience for sure. So what, uh, what kind of cannabis physician are you? Do you have a, a sort of a, a corner of this a growing field? So um, I wear many different hats and have a lot of different jobs. So I am by day the medical director of a cannabis cultivation and now a processing facility in Maryland. Um, I pro bono take care of over 350 patients. And I get these patients through um, referrals from other physicians who have heard from me, either me speaking or uh, presenting posters at different conferences and lectures. 
And generally speaking, these patients are um, at a therapeutic option. And so I get this referral to you know, see what we can do to help them either have a better quality of life before they die or change their course entirely. So you're almost the physician of last resort then, huh? That's a tough one. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a bad name. But yeah, I think it's pretty accurate. No, sorry. And then what I, I, ga- I gather their you know, patients' information and, and case studies, and I share that information. And I teach doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers, and pretty much anybody that would listen to me um, about medical cannabis and the results that um, my patients see. Can, can you share with us a story of uh, like your greatest success story, something uh, a patient that came to you seeking uh, an alternative option uh, that that you managed to, I, I, I don't know, like what are the worked. grounds for where it worked for basis is? So, so the one that still raises, you know, goosebumps in me is an eight year old girl who had a, um, spread of her acute lymphocytic leukemia to her brain. She failed chemo, radiation, and bone marrow transplant. And every institution um, wiped their hands of of her and said that she's now to go home to die in hospice. And we came to see her, met the family, met the grandparents, met the parents, cousins, and she was literally only on methadone and morphine. She was laying on a couch, really not responsive. And the goal was to give her a better quality of life before she died. And we started her on a microdose cannabis oil, which is a very small amount of oil that went under her tongue. We did it four times a day in the first two weeks. We weaned her off completely of her, of her narcotics. In the second two weeks, she started eating and engaging with family and friends. And then going into the second month, she started to exhibit what I like to call um, stereotypical eight-year-old behavior, which is um, talking back to her mom, refusing to uh, take a bath. I believe eye rolling was involved. <laughs> and, the mother, and the mother aptly you know, saw that this was not the behavior of a dying child. And when I lecture, I show the before and after uh, MRIs of her brain where um, the before showed a complete, you know, encompassing of this cancer along the meninges of her or the covering of her brain. And the after it was gone. And that was two months. She's still alive. And she's now 12. Wow. And what kind of a dose? You said a small dose. What kind of a dose were you prescribing her? So, um, When I call a microdose, it's a term of art. It isn't like 10 to the minus three or whatever. Um, And I substantiate it with studies that are done um, benchtop by uh, an Italian um, basic science researcher. And so I took what what she used on the benchtop for different cancer cell lines and calculated what it would be in milligrams per ml. And that's what is being used. And so half of the dose is in the raw form or the acid form of the plant. The other half is in the heated or decarboxylated form. Mm -hmm. The total cannabinoid constituent is less than uh, 1.2 milligrams. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And it's got a 10 to one ratio of THCA to TH to CBDA and THC to CBD. And it has all the terpenes and it's made from amalgam of um, different cultivars and uh, we we work somebody up to um, four ml a day in divided doses. But, but we're, and that's what we're, we're talking about it. four times a day, one point five milligrams of cannabinoids. Um, each each time, each so time. a total of tiny, 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 yeah, tiny less tiny than doses. five milligrams in a day. Deb is a real believer. Wow. In, you're a real believer in microdosing, are you not? I I really am, and and if you think about it, it started as a thought experiment. Because if you think about our endocannabinoid system, we make these chemicals on demand. They're used locally. They're broken down quickly, and they're not stored. That's right. You're talking about an you're talking about anandamide or two AG. The 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 yeah, our own our own our own endogenous cannabinoids. One, correct. Yeah, right. So and and why then would a plant that has way more than what we have that that our body makes 
is fat soluble. It's used systemically and it's stored acting almost as its own depot. I, why would we need huge amounts? It's a great it, question. It's, it's a great question that I don't think anybody knows the answer to quite na- quite naturally, right? Right. I, so I, I would be a liar if I said I had the answer to and I don't. Yeah. But what I found is with my patients, I start off at this low dose and very rarely do I have to go up higher. I want to ask you something. You, you said to me a couple of things when we first met. You said, I'm tired of throwing cannabis at you to patients. What did that mean exactly? Did you feel like you were over prescribing when you first started? No, I feel like in order for our bodies to respond to anything, any kind of therapeutic modality, whether it be traditional pharmaceutical or cannabinoid medicine, I feel like our bodies need to be ready or set. Our internal environment needs to be prepared to respond properly to this medicine mm. or any medicine. How do we do and that? So when, How do we do that? I, I change people's diets. I look at it. And again, I have, I have science backing me up. We um, change people's diets to a whole food, plant only, no processed foods, including no processed no oils other than the cannabis oil that they receive. No oils. And no oils. No, no olive oil. No coconut oil. No, no. Those are those are those are toxic to our body. Those are highly processed food. Our our food technologies has evolved way more quickly and than our own body evolution. And so our bodies don't know what to do with it. It's highly toxic. Um, oil destroys the, the the carpeted endothelial cells in our blood vessel, which is a large endocrine organ that secretes nitric oxide that helps with vasodilation and, and um, proper functioning of our um, cardiovascular system, and it destroys it. So it's, it's, it's toxic and it's not good. I try to get our patient's pH to greater than seven because our body's own immune system works better in an uh, a more alkaline environment. What is, what, how do we how do we do that? How do we get change our pH? High alkaline so, foods, I would imagine. So ideal. So a whole food, plant only, no added oil, no animal products. I'm not using the V word, vegan or vegetarian. I heard that. Yes, I heard that. Because Coca Cola is vegan and Swedish Fish are vegan, and my yep. daughter said some parts are vegan. So I'm not suggesting any of those foods. So that's why I don't Potato use the term. <laughs> yeah, potato but, chips are vegan. Potato right? chips are vegan, yeah. 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 So I'm not I'm not suggesting any of that. And depending upon what we're trying to treat will determine how narrow or broad I I will allow you to go. But uh we test the, the your pH by uh, a urine pH test strip in the morning and that's used as a guideline. The the thing is is that the, the, the gold standard would be for me to do an arterial puncture and run a, a blood gas, but that's exceedingly painful, expensive, and cumbersome. So we d- we just have, you know, people, you know, check their morning urine and follow it as a benchmark. Um, and then with that, by eating a whole food plant-only diet, we also change the microbiome. What's, so which microbiome, is the what? The microbiomes are the are the organisms, organisms that live within and without us. And, and, well, it's bacteria, archaea, and viruses, and fungi. And those, we can alter that by what we eat. And so those foods that we eat can grow bacteria and and these microbes that can either help or hurt us. And these chemicals that can help us can actually be highly anti-inflammatory and very supportive of our our environment to allow that microdose to work properly. Hmm. It's interesting. So how long does it take to change the body's pH on a plant-based oil-free diet? So interestingly, you can, I mean, our pH changes throughout a day continually, right? Yeah. So I, you, I can change your, your, your pH in a day, oh. literally in a day. The microorganisms in your, in your body a little bit different. I've just started sending out samples to test microbiomes, but um, for my research, it looks like it takes a couple of weeks to, to turn that over. Not bad. Not difficult. What about, and, and no. is gluten a part of, is that on the banned list also? Like Andrew Wiles' so, diet, the gluten-free diet? Yeah. So the, the challenge is, is that we have had highly processed foods, including highly processed wheat products. So wheat and gluten are not necessarily bad. It's just that we've been exposed 
to this very refined, highly processed foods that have exposed a lot of the the wheat protein and other proteins in our bodies that our immune systems go after. So if you have a, a known gluten insensitivity, I would say stay away from it. But I'm not suggesting that as part of the diet, and I go through this with patients, that they're eating um, highly refined breads or pretzels yeah, or any of like that. It's kind of sterilized, berries. isn't it? Yeah, I guess like so. This is a, as I'm a, I'm a sourdough fermenter, and I've had people who are like, yeah, I'm gluten intolerant, but I love your sourdough bread. And it's, it, you know, when you get into processed bread, it's it's almost sterilized in a way. And, and that's the difficulty is there's no, there's no agent acting to help break it down. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I think we can agree that when we chew on something that those particle sizes are very different than what they do to create the flour to make Wonder Bread. Mm-hmm. Sure. Of course. But, and, and fish, yeah. like even like wild caught fish out so the challenge with fish, so one, it does acidify our body, and two, unfortunately, it's a bioaccumulator. So, you know, small fish eat smaller fish, eat smaller fish, and our, our oceans and rivers and lakes, sadly, are poisoned with heavy metals and toxicities. And so if you literally go and analyze these fish, they are hugely toxic organisms, unfortunately. And so you can get what you think you want to get, which are omega-3 to 6, you know, ratios in, in diets without having fish at all. You can get it through fac- flaxseed. Hemp oil. Hemp seed. Hemp, seed. hemp is, is um, probably the most perfect ratio yeah. of omega-3 to 6 that you can, that you can ingest. So you, are, are you, you follow this, this diet? It, feels, it sounds restrictive to me, I have to say. I mean, I know you're a regular person, but that sounds like a restrictive diet. Do you feel that you're limited in what you eat if you follow this diet? No, not at all. I eat this way for well over 15 years. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah, and I go out to dinner and I meet the most incredible uh, chefs who embrace this. And so I I tell my patients, if you're going to a place that, that, you know, pre-cooks everything, you shouldn't be eating there anyway, whether you're a vegan or not. but otherwise, otherwise, you know, you can eat a whole host of delicious foods. You've got herbs and spices that are incredible and open for everyone. And people who embrace it recognize maybe they don't like the chicken or the fish. Maybe they really do like the seasonings and flavors that go along with it. And you can do that with vegetables. I want to change the topic a little bit. That's all very fascinating, and, and thank you for sharing it. You need to write the cookbook now, I guess. Um, <laughs> you said something. Thank you. You're welcome. You said something to me that I thought was very interesting about the way the endocannabinoid system works, and it, it set off a light bulb in my mind, which is that you said it's not a light switch. It's a, a rheostat. Now, for, I had to look up what a rheostat is, basically, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a dimmer switch, right? Um would you explain to those of us who like to use metaphor to understand how these little, um, uh, you know, uh, molecules work, uh, what what that means exactly? So, simplistically, I think we all like the idea of the receptor theory, where there's a one lock that has one key that opens up one door, and a lot of times people use that to explain how many different chemicals work in our body, not just the endocannabinoids, but understanding that our bodies have receptors that therefore our body makes chemicals that interact with those receptors to me was my aha moment that cannabis was a real medicine and not some something else. Um, No differently than opiates sit on receptors in our bodies that turn on or turn off different things that lead to certain um, effects. The receptor theory is great to sort of globally wrap your head around and go, okay, now I get that. But really it's a more delicate balance of turning things on and off. And endocannabinoids specifically have an incredible job of maintaining a physiologic balance, otherwise known as a homeostasis. turns things on and turns things off um, to try to maintain that balance. That's its job to do that. So 
you know, if, if you are having a stimulus, a painful stimulus, so you, there's something called an action potential that comes down, you know, these nerve tracks and continues to fire, the purpose of our endocannabinoid system is try to try to suppress that, which is why if you stub your toe, you know, you don't automatically have to run to a hospital. You know, our body has a way of quelling and mitigating that pain that by the dimmer using the dimmer system. And so endocannabinoids help to dim that pain over a period of time, correct? Exactly. It's just that when our body is overwrought or somebody like threw a switch on our immune system and now we're we're sick. And maybe our pH is less than seven and we're eating things that perhaps we think are good for us, but, you know, physiologically really are not good for us. We were never meant to eat the way we're eating now. Um, our body sort of loses the fight and the endocannabinoid system says, okay, I give. And that's where cannabis can come into play. It's where changing your diet comes into play, you know, creating an environment where it's receptive to these chemicals and then that's where the chemicals come into play from the cannabis plant. If you were to write a, f a cookbook and, uh, on uh, sort of the, the whole plant-based diet and cannabis, what would it be called? Do you have a title in mind? Well, that's a good question. I have a whole bunch of different ways of thinking about it. But if I were to, to, to do it you know, <laughs> in honor of my mom, it would be vegan kicking and screaming. Because my mother, first generation from, from Russia – um, was a junk food addict, and I ultimately convinced her to begrudgingly change her diet, and she did. And it was amazing. She got off of three different blood pressure pills, her statin medicine for elevated cholesterol, all of her, you know, the majority of her pain meds, except for when she started, you know, fr fracturing her bones. Um, and unfortunately, she just didn't have enough time in front of her um, to get rid of the half life of that the drug, which that ultimately led to her death. What do you think about but, what do you think about the V word? <laughs> the V word's good. I like that. I will sell it to you really cheap. <laughs> because because <laughs> V could mean vegetables. I, not I think we should vegan. collaborate. I think you you know you're the writer on <laughs> I well, got some ideas. I, I mean, out of curiosity, and, and I'm about to do something. Uh, admittedly, this is going to be a very self-serving. Uh, no, question. a very no, no, okay. a very stoner. I'm going to play the the okay, typical play stoner, the stoner here, Go on, and I'm going to ask a, an odd question. Um, is there something I can eat uh, if I know I'm going to smoke cannabis that's going to make it more effective, so I can eat something and then get more high? Mangoes, so, mangoes, mangoes. <laughs> you always talk about that. Yeah, so anything with, you know, mercine in it is, you know, reportedly something that can help augment the effects, this, the, the intoxicating effects of, of um, cannabis. I think any, any, any food that has mercine in it could probably, you know, help you out there, um, which in a way is, you know, part of that entourage effect, right? So like cannabis plant has all these incredible terpenes and, and so really it shouldn't be just about you know, a singular component, the THC, um, you know, your high or the intoxicating effects of it can be balanced and augmented, you know, with the plant in and of itself just by having a, a, a great, you know, cultivar that has all of the, the different constituents. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about epidiolex. Is that how we pronounce it? Epidiolex. Epidiolex. Thank you. This is the um, new anti-epilepsy uh, pharmaceutical that GW Pharma has put onto the market. It is, from my understanding, it's a one-to-one -one THC CBD product grown by their very special plants under lock and key somewhere in the UK, correct? So I think you're thinking the one-to-one -one is um, their other pharmaceutical, which is Sativex? called Sativex. Sativex, okay. Right. And Epidiolex is... You know the similar description, lock and key in greenhouses in somewhere in the UK, but it's um, CBD only, but a whole plant extract of it. Got it. Now I want to understand. Someone asked me this question, which I had no answer to, which was, "Is this a great breakthrough in the world of medical cannabis?" Or, I, I mean, when I was looking at at Sativex, I learned that it was something like seven or eight hundred dollars a month for a prescription, which made it very prohibitive and very difficult to have access to. Is Epidiolex a similar sort of interesting but highly out of reach product? Do you have any sense of that? So I think, I think we have to thank, we meaning like the medical field and 
people who are the, the, the doubting physicians and healthcare providers, we have to thank GW Pharma for their, you know, intense research and study for this because they truly then have just proven that it's not a schedule one drug. That's right. right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. my take on That's it. That's sort of the, 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 the meat it. of the question here, right? That yeah, it does I mean, have a medical use. Yeah, exactly. So, so it, you know, all the other issues, it, it has medical use. So I think we have them to thank for doing all that hard work, effort, study, and putting a ton of money into it. I think there's a couple of things that may or may not come of this, which is um, what does that mean for CD grown in, you know, the 29 states plus the District of Columbia? Are they going to have, you know, some sort of a restriction on it? Is the DA going to say yes it's, it's not a Schedule One drug. We deschedule it, but it's only for Epidiolex and GW Pharma stuff. I, I mean, it raises a whole lot of questions. It does, yeah. But the weird thing is, is I think, you know, everybody's doing it now. It would be incredibly difficult to for the government to restrict the growing of CBD products as well. You know, like I, I think that would be incredibly challenging. Um and also, I mean, you're right about the expense. I mean, when these pharmaceutical companies are studying this and going through all of the hoops that they have to go through in order to become FDA approved, it comes with a price. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, that price is highly expensive. So the question as a parent or a patient is, what's the difference between that and what I can get in a dispensary? You know, that's that's tested in a legal market. It's a good question. What do you as a physician think of the difference between a cannabis derived CBD and a hemp derived CBD? And I know that's a broad question, but can you shed any light on that one? Yeah. So, you know, as a scientist, you know, CBD is CBD, a carbon's a carbon, right? So now you're you're discussing where if you're extracting it, where are you extracting it from? So we all know that you know, cannabis and hemp, which is, you know, cannabis sativa L anyway, you know, is our, our bioaccumulators, just like our fish, right? So that's why if there's some kind of toxic waste. You want to grow fields of hemp to, to, to remediate that soil. The, the, you know, cannabis traditionally is grown, you know, in a basement, in a closet, you know, now in warehouses legally and now in um, greenhouses legally. And they're highly tested. And you worry about pesticides and heavy metals, and it's tested for that. Hemp traditionally is field grown. And even if they say they're growing it organically, unfortunately, our air is filled with toxins, as we all know. And it's a bioaccumulator. It does it really well. And so the question is, when you extract it, you concentrate heavy metals and or pesticides, and you worry about, you know, what in addition to that CBD is what you're getting if it's extracted from hemp and not tested. And therein lies my, my, my question. That's quite, that's problem. Number one, problem number two is what are the other constituents that ride along with it? So, you know, the entourage effect, you know, is alive and well. And, and I, I believe that it, that's why cannabis as a plant works as well as it does, as opposed to a single molecule like Marinol. Um, we need to compare and contrast the differences between what you get from extracting from a hemp plant and those cultivars versus what you get when you extract from um, a, a cannabis plant, a medicinal cannabis plant. No differently than people say different strains affect them differently. Mm -hmm. So would, would you... But are you uh, wait, I want to ask. So are, oh, you, yeah. are you saying that cannabis-derived CBD is the preferred medicine? I'm, I'm, no, I'm saying that um, right now in our country, the way things are being cultivated and tested, I think that we can be assured a little bit better when we get cannabis derived CBD in a legal state that's been tested for pesticides and heavy metals. Mm -hmm. And also the other constituents that go along with it, because when you extract it, you're going to have, you know, some terpenes and flavonoids and all the other things that go along with it versus, you know, a hemp derived, which is traditionally, you know, field grown. And mm. you, you know, unless it comes with a, with a, a lab test testing for pesticides and heavy metals, you really, 
you know, are, are not knowing what, what's happening there. Okay. So would you, would you then assess that this is more of like a moral victory kind of thing that this exists here in, in now, um, you know, we have a, like a formalized prescription type medication that doctors are more familiar with that is cannabis based. So maybe we can get more people on board, uh, or even, you know, the grand scheme of like using this, uh, FDA approval to then challenge like the schedule one, uh, rating and, uh, definition in, at, at the federal level. Is this more of something that can be used as a tool, but not really effective as a medicine or, or what, what is this thing? <laughs> yes. E all of the above. No, it's, <laughs> so I think, I, I think, you know, it's, it, it, it's a medicine for epidiolex is a medicine for very narrow, you know, two seizure disorders, LG and Dravet. Um, I think it can be used as a tool to show at least that CBD should not be under that schedule one rubric. I think Sativex could show that, you know, cannabis itself shouldn't be under a schedule one rubric. I think they did a lot of hard work and effort on behalf of all of us for that. I think that there are a lot of people who are in like three different mindsets. One says, no way, cannabis is never a medicine. Yes, cannabis is a medicine. And I'm curious, and maybe they are. Maybe it is a medicine. Educate me. So the ones that say no way may now embrace, you know, a pharmaceutical derived medicine. Um, and ultimately, if we are talking honestly about medicine, it's about patient access and giving them what they need as a, as an alternative. Right. And so if you have a healthcare provider that puts up a roadblock, that's not a good thing. So if this breaches that and they start to understand that and see the results that I've seen with patients, I think maybe that door would open wider. Deb, I want to ask one final question on product, basically, which is on the on the on the on the burning topic of topicals. Um, I've been looking hard to try to understand what is the minimal dosage of cannabinoids in a topical that will offer relief for, say, neuropathic pain or maybe even burn. Sometimes even people use them for acne. My nephew does, for example. Is there a minimum dosage per per milliliter that we want to be looking for when we buy topicals? Wow, wouldn't that be a great a great you know study? There's <laughs> maybe <laughs> get, in, get in on that. I don't know. You can do that one. Go on. Let's do it. Let's get some funding and let's do this. So there's you know unfortunately these these studies because because this was you know patient driven. Um, medicine, right? Which applaud all of, all of the advocates out there that have, have done this. Yeah. You know, people have gone for yeah. us to pave the way for us to even have this discussion openly. Um, you know, there really hasn't been studies. And I, I look at topicals really as the unsung hero where, you know, people really aren't considering it. If you think about it though, our skin has all of the receptors that our internal organs have. So if you cut yourself, a paper cut, right? It hurts. And that's because of, of peripheral nerves. So you've got those CB1 receptors because that's where peripheral nerves lay. And then when you scab over or get infected, right, those are CB2 receptors on immune cells. So it's all over your skin. And so your skin is incredibly receptive. Again, we make endocannabinoids on demand, used locally, not stored, broken down quickly. Yeah. There's no reason to have grams of cannabis on, you know, to, to help treat certain ailments. Now, maybe certain ailments need a, a higher amount, but I would certainly start off low and go slowly and titrate as you need it. Um, I know people with neuropathic pain that use an ultra low dose cannabis cream that has less than 14 milligrams per ounce. Ooh. God, that's nothing. That is a second shocking about, statistic out of this. That's just nothing. I know. I'm gonna I'm gonna take it a step further and say that the extracted combination of these cannabinoids have never been heated, which means it's all in its raw or acid form. Oh, that's interesting. So the acids might be more useful as topicals. Is that one of the possible conclusions here? I don't want to say they would be more useful. I'm saying that the acids are useful. 
I think that cannabinoids, I never want to vilify a cannabinoid and exalt another, you know, so I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge believer of all of it, you know, and I, and, and my guess is in this cream iteration, initially it's all acid form, but maybe there's some slight decarboxylation decar- over time. So maybe you have a little bit of, of, um, you know, the acid form as well as the decarboxylated form. And remember these cannabinoids work in a multimodal way. THC is the only one that really sits on CB1 and CB2 receptors. All the others kind of modulate and work on other types of receptors, yeah. non-cannabinoid, endocannabinoid receptors. Which is the one that works and, on the wrinkle receptor? <laughs> oh, God. I'll tell you what. If, when we find that. <laughs> yeah, sure. hurry up. There's the million dollar Come industry on. right there. <laughs> billions yeah, and billions of anti-aging I'm dollars. sorry I interrupted you. Why don't you finish your thought? I think it's like, isn't that called like cannabis botoxylin or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> yeah. But come on, you were saying something that was possibly much more important than wrinkles. No, no. So, no, I was just saying that, you know, it works in a multimodal way and that's why I don't, you know, say one is more or better than others. And in fact, some may work better in some people than others. We're all an N of one. Everybody's an individual. And, you know, I think that's the beauty of this plant. Yeah, is but that science doesn't do well with N of one. Science yeah. needs N of millions. You know that. Come uh, on. Science, science needs a single molecule in N of millions. Yeah, so yeah. this goes, this turns it on its head and says, we've got a whole host of molecules. Most are bioactive and we're all an individual. And that's the exciting part of this plant. I want to talk to you more and more and more, but we're going to end this interview right now. It was really interesting talking to you. So happy you were able to join us, Dr. Deborah Kimless. What is your um, website called? I don't have a website. We have a, a company called Forward Grow, and we're out of Maryland, and I don't have a website. Um, it's for, Forward own. Grow, like forwardgro.com, correct? Correct. Yeah, Forward That's Grow, G R O.com. So if you want to find more about Forward Grow, or about Dr. Kemlis, you That's can go. That's where you go to forward forward grow. grow.com. Deb, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. You can like and follow the Brave New Weed podcast on all the best social media platforms. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash brave new weed or on Twitter at brave new weed or Instagram at brave new weed. That was really interesting, didn't you think? I, I absolutely love it. There's now been easily three times uh, in interviews with doctors in the process of producing this podcast where I've had my mind literally just blown. We by have statistics. amazing doctors working in the cannabis industry. Do you realize these are really great minds and great people who who really are thinking broadly and thinking very differently about health and 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 what it takes, what what it, what health really means. Yeah, and and you know, there's something that like. It's easy to, it's easy to to make light of of cannabis in the world, and it's easy to look at all the fun, haha, 420, hey, funny shows on TV, all this stuff. Uh, but when you really dig into the fact that this is plant medicine that is saving lives, it really adds a dimension and a weight to what we're doing that that I wasn't even fully. But how about for the when. fact? I, and this is what always blows me away is that. It's been on Earth longer than we have. Yeah. There, there is some, I mean, you know, I'm not religious at all, but there is some weird connection as to why this plant that has this many benefits grows so abundantly almost everywhere. Yeah. And every living creature has the system in their body to receive it. You know, it never ceases to amaze me. Really wild. Anyway, listen, I want to tell you that uh, the next episode is interesting in a very different way. And I've been wanting the answer to this question for many, many months now, which is if Donald Trump is making America great again, why the hell is he giving the cannabis industry to the Canadians? Mm -hmm. And we have somebody to talk about that on the next episode. And I think I'm fascinated by the topic. Are you? I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I was out ill when you did this interview, so I'm super excited to to dig in and hear it. Good. Always glad to keep you excited, Matthew. (laughs) Come back again soon. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Brave New Weed Podcast. This episode and all future episodes are made possible by amazing listeners like yourself. If you like what you've heard, we encourage you to show your support 
by giving $1 a month for special access and rewards on patreon.com slash brave new weed. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram via at brave new weed. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash brave new weed. And remember, you can always find more information about us or information discussed in each episode by pointing your favorite browser to bravenewweed.com.